Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our class tonight, Wednesday night, with Guy Finley. Um, and we're going to have our, our class tonight. If you, if you haven't joined us before, uh, Guy talks for about an hour. And then we go, we take a five minute break, and then we have about a 25 minute uh, Q&A for where all of you can ask questions and or make comments about what you've been working on in your inner life. It's meant to be participation. Participational, is that a word? It, it sounds, I, participative, per, participative. Join in. <laughs> Join in later on when it's your turn. Okay, now, if you're in the room and you have a cell phone, turn it off. Now's the time to do it. Um, online, anytime you might have a, if there's a technical problem, you can reach us in the chat boxes or the question, uh, control panel, the question box, and Kate will help you behind the scenes. And you can always do that, support at guyfinley.com. Kate will help you back there as well. And you can also use that to uh, write in a question for Guy for later on. And speaking of questions, next week is our second kind of go around with Deep Dive Wednesday. Bring your helmets, the, you know, the Mike Nelson ones where you go way down. And it's, it's, it's a time, and I really like the first one, where you ask Guy for a more thorough explanation of the material he's talked about. And something that you'd you, you just like to hear a little bit more, whether it's in a talk, whether it was in one of his books, or even from any past master, if you'd like to, um, to get a little more explanation or a deeper dive into any of that. And write it down. You can send it to support at guyfinley.com. You can send it in the chat boxes. But do write it. You guys here, you can give it to Kate or Chris. Um, just write it down. And try to get it to him early so he has a chance to look at it by Monday or Tuesday of next week. So that's our homework for now, and just anything that we want a thorough, more thorough explanation on, you can do that. So let's go ahead and get started with tonight's class. The topic tonight is realize perfect strength by never forgetting these two fear-busting facts. Fear-busting fact number one. Fear of any weakness is a part of the weakness feared. Number two, the more we try to forget our weaknesses, the stronger they become. I do need to have this on, right? There we go. Welcome everyone in the room and wherever you are in the world, whatever day or time it is that you're joining us. I would tell you that you're in the right place doing the right thing if you want to understand why it is that your life has these constant upheavals in them. This kind of insane roller coaster of yes and no, yes, no. I have a lot of material to present this evening. Our Wednesdays are usually what we call our discovery classes. It won't be any different tonight. I'll invite you at a certain point to share some of your thoughts. You might be a little more reluctant than usual because it's going to be a little more delicate of a subject, but hoping at least those of you in the room and those of you who have been studying with me for some time get over that fear and join in so that we can all begin to understand something that has eluded us, and I might say for good reason. Relax, please. I 
I don't say this to be punitive, it's not a judgment, it's just something that you need to see as a fact. In fact, nothing that I ever say should be taken as any form of judgment or punitive uh, uh, statement. There's one reasons why one reason why we join together here in this room and online or throughout the world. And that is so we can begin to understand what we don't understand yet. And to that point, what you don't understand yet is that you have no idea what strength is. None. When, when, when something goes afoul, when you run into a problem, when the pain appears seemingly out of nowhere, what is the first thing that your mind does other than it measures the extent of what it is that it fears and then it looks for some commensurate relationship with someone or something or a time to come when you'll be able to deal with this darkness that has delivered this blow and brought you back once again to your knees where you were yesterday or the day before yesterday when he said this or she did that or the world turned upside down as it does increasingly every single day. And then nothing makes sense and in order for it to make sense, I've got to go find some intelligence. I'm going to go find a guru or a teacher or some financial whiz or some other religious or psychological idiot that I hope somehow is going to anchor me in some kind of understanding so at last I'm not knocked left and right every time this doesn't go the way I want it to or whatever the case may be. And because we don't know what real strength is, we have no idea where to look for it. All we know to look for all we know where to look for strength is in our best ideas or the ideas of someone else. We look for strength in the past. And if ever there was evidence that the past has no strength, no wisdom, no intelligence, no love, you don't have to look at the world, you can look at yourself as a reflection of the world. And you can realize that you buckle at the drop of a hat, the smallest thing can set you off. And again, it isn't a judgment. What I want to do with you is start to understand something about the nature of what real strength is and to get to the point, do you know why nobody knows by and large, such a small handful of men and women on this planet know anything at all about real strength. Can any of you guess why? It's because nobody on this planet wants to investigate their weakness. I just want strength. I just want security. I just want confidence. I just want consolation. And it never dawns on me that what I'm looking for and calling consolation or strength or security is nothing less than my idea, my image of those things carried forward through an in, in, in endless time. To where just like my mother and father who had to drink or drug themselves in order to get through the pain of all the disappointments in their life, their broken relationships and everything else that went to hell in a handbasket. The only way I know to do that is to look for strength in a drug, in a drink, in a food, in a, in a possession, in an imagined power. And I spend my life in the pursuit of those things. Do I not? Should I tell you something about me? In one respect, it gets easier and easier and easier to come and speak. In another respect, it gets more and more difficult. I don't want to be anything to you. And what a mistake you make if you make me something to you. A 
a guru isn't strength. An enlightened human being isn't your strength. What you're invited to do is to discover the strength that's, that you can sense or see or read or understand obviously exists in a way that you don't understand it yet. I remember the first time I ever met Mr. Howard. It is said in this work that there are parts of us that because of their level, they are drawn to that level which is above them. There are parts of us that resist and reject anything above us. That's obvious. But there are also parts that belong to a certain matrix within this mind and heart that want to understand what that other, what that means. That want to participate in, an, in a strength that seems on one hand so obvious and yet on the other hand when I try to get my hands on it, I, all I grab is dust and air. But there it is, and you can see it, and you can sense it, and if you can, oh, are you lucky to have found it in someone? But that which you find in someone is not yours. Never forget that. So I want to look at this with you in such a way that we can begin as individuals to no longer live, now listen carefully, in the pursuit of a strength to come because we're no longer resisting a weakness that is present. Do you understand that? Let's take a nice deep breath. <sighs> and get into it a little bit. I have a, 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 like four or five special key lessons. I have a special writing for tonight. And I'm doing this more and more and more because I want to put in words that which you can come back and look at to help you remember what impressed you as you were listening to the material. What ideas struck me because if I can get some note just resonating a little bit in myself, just a little bit of that ember, then perhaps I can reconnect with the part of myself that understood it. I've said this before but ever so briefly, when I was a kid I was scared of the dark. Ain't no shame in admitting it. I was sure a werewolf. I was, was sure a werewolf was there because at the tender age of whatever it was, eight or nine years old, my parents thought it was wise to let me watch the original Werewolf of London, from which I have never recovered <laughs> properly. So I want to look at this idea of what becomes of that child, of you, of me, in bed, laying down and suddenly, for whatever reason, a breeze cracks open the closet door and it makes a little noise. And when that child sees that closet door open in the dark, what happens inside of that child? The child is suddenly filled with fear that a monster is in the closet. Do you remember this? Now, do you think it's accidental that almost, with, with almost no exception, every child that ever was lives with the fear of the monster in the closet? Do you think that's an accident? They call it other things, maybe in the other, uh, other worlds, but it's the same here. And that child lives with that. I know I lived with it till I was 42 years old. No, I know that I lived with it for a long time until what? Until one way or the other, either mom or dad threatening me or somebody sleeping with me or whatever it was. It dawned on me that this monster, whatever it was, didn't really exist. That somehow, whatever it was that I was terrified, the feel was very real, wasn't it? But the why was questionable. At least it became questionable. Questionable enough that I didn't have to have someone stay with me or go through all of the iterations that children do when they're afraid. Yeah? Yes? yes. So the child begins to understand what we'll call the, the, the dark imagining. The dark imagining. And the child in time outgrows the dark imagining of the monster in the closet. But what becomes of that childish mind and its fears of monsters when it becomes an adult? 
Do you understand the question? What is once thought to have been a childish fear of monsters through a runaway imagination that is recognized as being out of place. Of course, there's no uh, werewolf in the closet. But that childish mind and its fears gradually are replaced by new, in quotes, social, cultural, religiously created fears. So now it's not a child, and now it's not a monster in the closet, but it's something that just happened on the news, or it's the way you looked at me when I suggested something. So that all of a sudden, the exact same mind that we think has become sophisticated, when it hasn't become sophisticated at all, save for the devices that it turns to and imagines will free it from what? From its own dark imagining. Can you see it with me? where the, the form changes. Before it was a werewolf in the closet. Now, where is this going to go if they go through with this? What's it going to mean? If he does this, or if the doctor said that, oh my God, are you kidding me? So that there's nothing there. Just the possibility of something that might punish or otherwise push me around and now, instead of a monster in the closet, I live with one eye peeled on you, this, them, or that to make sure that nothing's coming out to do what? To take from me what I believe is my life and the strength that I've derived from all of the things, by the way, that I gathered together in order to do what? To protect me from the monsters in the closet. Can you see this? The kid throws the covers over his head, doesn't he? Do you remember doing that? Putting your head, it's like, a, if I close my eyes, it's not there. Kid closes his eyes and does everything he can to, uh, to uh, resist the appearance, avoid the fear, or the child maybe tries to conquer the fear. But the point is the action never works. See, let me get real simple. Not one psychological fear belongs in your life. Not one. Not one. But because you don't understand the nature that creates the fear through an unseen process of identification with what amounts to some dark imagining. What you imagine has no power over you until you imagine that you need power from what you've imagined or that what you've imagined can take your power away. And here's the big problem, and we'll make a transition here. What we have failed to realize, and I can only hope that you understand and feel this, what we've failed to realize is that fear is the monster itself. Not what you fear. Fear itself is the monster. And we don't understand what creates fear and because we don't understand what creates fear, but believe we do, we spend our time in pursuit of ways to get rid of the conditions that we think cause the fear, instead of using the condition to investigate the consciousness responsible for its endless appearance and its destruction of the body. Its destruction of the body. What do you, th ang what do you think anxiety is? What do you think frustra What do you think any of these negative states are that visit you daily? I can tell you what they are. They are the result of a dark imagining that a man or a woman doesn't know they're going through because they don't understand what causes them to go into that dark imagining. Please? All right, so. Nice deep breath. You and I are now going to look at, as best we can, 
by creating a list of our own understanding, by sharing what we're going to, we're going to come to a point so we can start to recognize what is it that actually is the source of this fear that is our daily companion. Do you understand? And, and, I, and I mean this quite literally. You can have 10,000 different fears. How many of you have 10,000 different fears? I'm telling you there aren't 10,000 different fears. There are 10,000 forms of a single fear. And if you can begin to drill down because you're so tired of it, which you're not yet, you still believe you can save yourself. You can come to the point where you start to recognize what we're going to look at together right now. Take a nice deep breath. Let's bring up the list we're going to build. And here it is. Name some form of weakness you've seen in yourself. Or if it's too difficult to call out that weakness in yourself, name a weakness you've seen in others. Some character or quality where it's clear to you that either they have no clue as to its hidden cost, or worse, they must believe it to be some kind of strength. Name some form of weakness you have seen in yourself. And again, if, if, if that's too much for you to do, or you're, you're, <laughs> in your weakness you believe that someone else uh, shouldn't know what your weaknesses are, uh, that's it. I don't, don't think I don't understand that. I'm not going to volunteer a weakness. Why? Because I know how dark the world is. I know that if somebody gets their hands on a weakness of mine, I'm never going to hear the end of it. They'll, they'll punish me with it. They'll, they'll do something against me. I know it, I know it, I know it. And that's called fear, isn't it? Name some form of weakness you've seen in yourself. Or if it's too difficult, name a weakness you've seen in others. So I'm going to prime the pump. And then we'll get ready. How about, have you ever seen arrogance in yourself? Now, when a person is arrogant, do they think it's because they're weak? No, but we can see the all forms of arrogance are born of what? Fear. I'm afraid you won't see me the way I want you to see me. I'm afraid that you may see through me and therefore I must put on an act. How about this as a weakness? I can't wait to find somebody to blame for whatever my pain is. Why is blaming others for my pain a form of weakness? Because only a weak human being needs to find someone to blame for something that should be evident to them about their own consciousness forever finding something to complain about. How many of you are identified with some pain from the past? Yes or no? Do I have any hands? If not, I'll keep going. Chris. My first reaction is always to get frazzled and overwhelmed. I have seen in myself that my first reaction is always an overreaction. And I know it's a weakness. How do I know that overreacting is a weakness? How do I know that? You, you've said, I know that's a fact. How? Anybody? Because it betrays me. I've, I'm acting against myself when I overreact. Am I not? And what does it do to other people around me when I overreact? And yet when I'm in the throes of overreacting, do I not feel incredibly strong? Yes or no? Anybody else? Terry. The need to be seen as someone I depend on others seeing me the way I want to be seen. I know it's a weakness. Why is it a weakness? Because I'm terrified if anybody doesn't. I am compelled to act that way. Which means it isn't a choice on my part. It is rather the expression of some character in myself that completely believes that unless you see me the way I want to be seen, that I'm threatened by you. Yes or no? Anybody else? Ellen. Constant self-judgment. Big one. Now, Ellen said constant self-judgment is a form of weakness. Why is constant self-judgment 
a weakness because we're going to go into this in depth. Anybody? She said, because I'm undermining myself. No, constant judgment of myself is a weakness because the only reason I judge myself or anyone else is out of fear. There is no judgment of myself or anyone else that isn't rooted in a fear. Something about their nature, what they have said or done, has done what? It has set me off. It has set me off. I'm on fire. And I don't know what to do with this pain or this fire other than to look at you and judge you for being the one who makes me feel this way. So in judging you, I actually believe that somehow or other, I'm not the one who's on fire, that I'm not in this kind of pain because I wouldn't be if you hadn't said or done that. Please, do you see it? Very important. We're going to come back in depth. Anybody else? Deb. Deb. Uh, the need to control anything is a form of weakness. Why is it a form of weakness? Again, because I'm afraid if I don't control things, things are going to get out of control. I'm ignoring the board. Let me not do that. It's filling up quickly. Uh, Jill fawning. Oh, boy, there's a bunch. Oh, I missed them all, Kate. I was looking in the wrong place. Uh, uh, weakness, the fear of being helpless. We just talked about that one. Jane says, the fear of being alone. Why is that a weakness, the fear of being alone? Why is, why is that a weakness? Why? Because I'll do anything not to be. And I don't care who my company is, including my own thoughts denigrating me. Please, yes or no. Fear of not being able to handle, the, fear of tomorrow. Uh, I've seen that my fear of tomorrow compromises me today. I do things, I say things in order to get through that, which is tomorrow, that never get me through it, but rather do what? Bind me increasingly to the notion that somehow if I could just think this all through, I'd be able to get through tomorrow, which means that all of that, listen, not the thoughts themselves, but the thinker itself is a weakness. Yes? Uh, Randall, Claudia, thinking I need to answer some imagined what if, of course. One, intellectual or spiritual superior. Yes, obviously. Anytime I think I'm superior to any human being, it is a form of weakness. Why is thinking I'm superior to any human being, judging them, why is it a form of weakness? Anybody? Come on, come on. Because why, if, I, if I'm actually, sub, if I'm actually sub, do I have to think to myself when... Frankie, the turkeys at my, at my sliding. Do I have to think of something? You know, I'm, I'm superior to you. And let me show you how superior I am. Boo! Do I need to do that? No. But if I'm with somebody else, I have to prove I'm superior? What does that mean? It means I fear that they may see me as I fear I may be, which is inferior to them. Both are an illusion. Uh, bullied by others as a youngster, uh, as a weakness, all right, look, we're getting into, we're, you're, we're falling off track. I'm asking you, what is a weakness that I have seen in myself? Wayne. Fear of making yeah, look, uh, what I'm struggling to do here and want to do increasingly so is get rid of a lot of words. Here's a weakness. Lazy. I'm lazy. Why is that a weakness? Because not only do I not get done what I imagine needs to be done, but I judge myself for my laziness. Yes or no? How about this? I'm, I'm as ill-tempered as a, as, a, as a wolverine. Ill-tempered, angry. Is anger a weakness or a strength? Weakness. Debbie. Vanity. Daydreams. I live in fantasy. What did you say? Vanity. Oh, vanity. Ah, is vanity a weakness? Now, see, you're all going, yeah, that's a weakness. And what do I do all day long? <laughs> Why is vanity a weakness? Because the strength of the illusion has to be continually strengthened and kept in place, doesn't it? Who else? Chris. 
any time I've seen this weakness, I will sell my soul or your soul in order to get through a moment I don't want to go through. Is that not a weakness? The board is going so full here. Gosh, uh, wanting to, uh, inadequacy, yeah, fear of, is, is not the sense of being inadequate a form of weakness. And when I have that sense of inadequacy, that weakness, what do I usually do to make up for that weakness? What do I do? I come up with some way to be strong. I'm going to make a million dollars. I'm going to drive this kind of car. I'm going to dress in these kind of clothes. I'm only going to have the best of everything, and then everybody will know I'm not inadequate. (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) Impatience. Sally. Impatience. I'm like Johnny Carson. John. Pretending not to be disturbed or upset. I'm cool. <laughs> Why is pretending to be cool a weakness? Because not only do I, am I not cool, or I wouldn't have to pretend, but inwardly I'm burning, and I don't know anything at all about why I'm on fire. All right, there's, you wouldn't believe how many good responses came in. This is good. I didn't have time to go through it, but if you, you take the seven deadly sins, every last one of them is a weakness. Every last one of the seven deadly sins, a weakness. And are, to the point of building this list, are they not all some form of a weakness that we have either not seen or understand, and yet, for instance, I fear my own laziness. Do you judge yourself for being lazy? Take a deep breath. We're going to look at something. I hope I can bring you along. When we judge another human being, is it out of weakness or out of strength? Out loud. Does anybody question that fact? If I judge another human being, it's out of weakness. And what is the weakness that causes me to judge another human being? I'm asking you. I don't know what to do with what you've made me feel. And because I don't know what to do with what I blame you for, my only solution is to judge you as being someone responsible for a condition that I have no part of and that I wouldn't be suffering from if you hadn't been and done what I have judged you for being and doing. Please? Yes? Yes. Yes. Now, If judging others is a weakness, why is it a weakness? If judging others is a weakness, why is it a weakness? I'm trying to build an impression in your mind. We've seen that we judge, yes? Yes. We know that it's a weakness, yes? yes? So why? Not just notwithstanding that I don't know what to do with my own pain. What is it that's going on when I'm judging you? I'm trying to protect myself. Can you see it? And if I'm trying to protect myself, what am I trying to protect? A weakness. If I'm capable, and I am, if you're capable and you are, of a transcendent understanding. Something that isn't an all at once affair, but that moment by moment produces in you a kind of light by which suddenly you can see what you could not see before in yourself. Is that not a transcendent wisdom? And yet here I am, and for whatever reason, I am forever trying to protect the very condition inside of myself that if I were to understand it, I'll bring the next one. Do do we judge the moment? How many of you judge the moment? Why do I judge a moment? Is it out of weakness or strength? Is judging a moment out of weakness or strength? We're sure. So judging others is a form of weakness, yes? Yes. Judging the moment is a form of weakness, but that I feel compelled to do for whatever reason that we've outlined, 
because somehow, unless I protect myself from what you've done or said or the moment promise is gonna bring some pain, unless I do that, I'm in dire straits. Here's the big question. When you judge yourself, do you do it out of weakness or strength? When I judge myself, it feels like strength, doesn't it? You idiot. What's wrong with you? You, should be, you shouldn't be like that. When are you going to change? What's going to happen if you don't? And the consciousness involved in asking the question and identifying with the state believes it is superior to the consciousness that it is judging, does it not? And I'm trying to get you to see as best I, I know how that the consciousness that is judging itself is not superior to itself. It is hiding within itself the weakness that's there that it doesn't know what to do with and so it judges you for its presence and its pain. Please? If you put all this together, and I'm asking you to do so, does it not ask one very, very telling question, which is the following? In every one of the cases we outlined, is it not some weakness in us that, is it not some weakness in us we fear that is the judge, and for not knowing that to be true, are we not imprisoned by our own judgment of self? Judge not that ye be not judged. I've tried to show you as best I can that the kid laying in bed afraid of the monster in the closet did not lose the monster in the closet because now it owns the home. The unconscious nature that creates out of imagination some kind of dark creature does not outgrow that consciousness simply because it can hire guards to live in the house with it. Consciousness remains unchanged. And that's why our hope, if we're ever going to find a new kind of strength that isn't compromised, it's going to require that we find a new way to see ourselves and to understand this weakness. Until I understand my weakness, I am a servant to it. Am I not a slave to my own addictions? Is my addiction born of a weakness or a strength? And how about if I hate myself for my addiction? Is that born of a weakness or a strength? You, I can go through the whole list with you. So now we're going to look at these two, I call them fear-busting facts together. They're in a special writing. You can download it. I urge you to, I urge you to do so, and I urge you to study it. Part one, much in the same way, much in the same way that darkness is the absence of light, meaning that darkness has no existence, let alone authority outside of the light that grants it its temporary appearance, so is the following equally true. Weakness is the absence of strength. And just like the divine light that is everywhere and everlasting, so is divine strength ever present and more powerful than any transient condition imagined as being a challenge to it. Through the first part, darkness is the absence of light. What does that mean, that darkness is the absence of light? It means that without light, there's no darkness and that darkness itself has no authority to do anything. It can't do anything. It is the absence of what is light. So that not only does darkness of itself have no existence, but it has no authority outside of the light that grants it its temporary appearance. So here is the child, he or she sees the shadow in the closet. What is the strength of the shadow in the closet other than a momentary light created a shadow, the child sees the shadow and attributes strength to the shadow? 
Does any shadow have strength other than what is attributed to it through some form of dark imagination? Can you see that? So if that's true, that this darkness has no authority, none, no existence itself outside of the light that creates it momentarily, then so is it also true that weakness is the absence of strength. There is no weakness that exists without the strength that reveals it. There is no weakness without the strength that reveals it. Weakness is the absence of strength. I ask you to see for yourself. When am I weak? When do I do the things I would not instead of the things that I would? When do I do that? I do that when I can't see. I do that when I'm convinced that the weakness that is compelling me to act this way, to be tempted towards that, I do that when I believe in the weakness. That's when I do that which I ought not. And that I know I ought not, but I still do because I am compelled by that weakness to pursue a strength that is an imagined strength. Please? And then it goes on like the divine light that is everywhere and everlasting so is that divine strength ever present and more powerful than any transient condition imagined can ever challenge. So summary of the first part. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. My strength is that no weakness can appear within it unannounced. And the action of my strength is to dismiss anything that I might imagine and identify with in that darkness. I go before you to make the crooked places straight. I am the light that dwells in the darkness and that doesn't know anything about it but that I know everything about the darkness because everything about my nature reveals that which is in the dark and proves that that which is in the dark has no strength or authority lest some individual identify with that darkened imagine, imagination and believe it to be true. See, this is what we don't understand. You live in strength itself. You live in it. Do you not live in the light of the sun? Do you ever see the light of the sun? Rarely. You see what it reveals. You don't see the light of the sun. You live in the strength of the sun. S-U-N-S-O-N. You live in the strength of something that was here before you took a body that puts your body together that will see that your body disappears and that will never disappear by your side as a form of strength. There is a strength in you that you know not because you have imagined what strength is and cling to it. And only weakness imagines strength. Only weakness imagines a time to come when you will be stronger. Only weakness dreams up some condition under which when everything's complete, you'll be okay. Those are the dark imaginings of a consciousness set against itself. What is truly strong needs never to invent anything. It just needs to continue expressing itself in the individual who is willing to allow that light to do what is it intended to do, which is to what? To dismiss the shadows. Part two. And it's part of, it's a continuation. Nothing created has a weakness that isn't already married to a strength that fulfills its purpose. The only exception to this celestial law is found in an unconscious nature that imagines it has some strength of its own and that for having become identified with the illusion of that false image lives in constant fear of anything that comes along to challenge its dream. Please listen to the first part. This is real knowledge. You have to make it your own. It does no good that I can spell this out for you, save that it might help you remember something you've forgotten. 
Nothing created has a weakness that isn't already married to a strength that fulfills its purpose. Every tree is a creation and every creation by its nature requires something to constantly act upon it to complete it. That means that every creature has the, a weakness that by its nature, if you want, every creature has an emptiness. Every creature has a need. But whatever that emptiness and the need is of the creature, by the fact that it is created in that creature and sustained by the life that gives that creature its life, so is everything required to fulfill that need also given at the same time. So that the purpose of the creature is endlessly, constantly being cons completed. Endlessly being completed. Which means its weakness is always being perfected in the strength that made that weakness. So that its weakness is endlessly being perfected by the strength that that weakness requires in order to perfect itself. Are, are, am I communicating this at all? Here's the tree. Now the tree, you, you go push on a tree. I, I do it sometimes just to see what it's like to feel that kind of strength. You, can't, you push on a tree. If, if it's not too, if it's a regular tree, you're not, you, and I won't even see the top move. So that tree, but even though I can't see it, that tree resists the pressure against it. And it resists the pressure against it because in that moment it is being completed by the resistance that meets what pushes against it. So that it's strengthened in its weakness. It's strengthened in its weakness, but the tree doesn't know it has this weakness. The tree is the tree fulfilling the law of an endless completion of weakness and strength, fulfilling each other for a purpose of perfecting the creature and revealing the divine responsible for it. Am I just rambling on? I'm terrified of the wind. Every movement that isn't moving the way I think it should move sets me off. Because the only thing I can think of in that moment is that I didn't choose to make this motion. I didn't choose for this experience. And therefore all I know to do out of my weakness is say that shouldn't be there because this is threatening my strength. But when my strength is this imagined solidity, this imagined security, then everything that comes along to reveal that as not strength is my friend. And what isn't my friend is my imagination that tells me, look, you've got to stand up against this otherwise you're going to lose something tremendous. Nothing created has a weakness that isn't married to a strength that fulfills its purpose. In my weakness is thy strength made perfect. But something in me is afraid of weakness, isn't it? Weakness is the creature in the closet. I judge myself for stealing bites of food. I judge myself for the, 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 the miser inside of myself. I judge myself for my selfishness. I judge myself for anything that comes up in the moment that when it comes up threatens some corresponding positive image. And the moment the image is threatened, I believe that it is I who is being threatened. When it isn't I who is being threatened, it is an I in myself that is being threatened that has derived its strength from a weakness. Do you see it? Bring up key lesson number four, please. It's a bit of a summary and a lead into a transition for us. Everything created has a weakness until tested. Everything created has a weakness until tested. It's what becomes of each and every such revelation that tells the story of whether or not new strength is gained or its possibility lost. Imagine if trees were like you. 
There'd be none standing. They'd be broken, fighting. No, I don't want this. No, I don't want that. Why? Because a, a strong human being doesn't move. Strong human being is rigid, set. I have my opinions, my belief. And any wind that comes along is seen as an enemy. And when I meet an enemy, what do I do? Is having an enemy a form of weakness or a strength? It is a form of weakness. But when I have an enemy, I'm set against them, aren't I? Feels strong to me. But the reason it feels strong is because of the depth and breadth of identification with whatever that energy is that says, no, 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 I'm like this because you're like that. Everything created has a weakness until tested. God, I love that. See, I, I don't want my weaknesses tested. Do you? Do you think to yourself, you know, today, I hope that all of these weaknesses of mine that I don't even want to admit I have, but I, I hope that they're tested today. D who, who thinks like that? One day you will think like that. You won't have to get up and hope for it. You'll get up and understand that's what real life is. Is that something is brought into creation that requires balance, that requires being perfected for the glory of that which created it. And that in the need for its perfection, in order to perfect it, the weakness that is there temporarily is going to have to be strengthened. Because what is strengthening of a weakness other than an integration and a rebalancing of the parts involved? One day you'll see this picture You'll be in it. You'll understand that to hate yourself is the most insane thing a human being can do because they believe it proves somehow or other that they are stronger and better than what they despise in themselves. When I was working on this material and wrote this particular key lesson, everything created has a weakness until tested. It's what becomes of each and every one of those tests, of those revelations that tells the story of whether or not a new strength is gained or its possibility is lost. In Timothy, in the New Testament, he says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. When, when you are anxious or angry or frightened, when, when one of these weaknesses, this appetite, this hunger, this desire, this, this craving, when, when that comes over, do you ever think to yourself, God has not given us the spirit of fear? You know why it never comes to you? Because you don't take that moment of that desire as being a weakness. You see it as leading to something that will strengthen the way you feel when you get rid of whatever it is that's troubling you in that moment. There can only be one reason why, as I work towards the end of this talk, that we live with this psychological fear. We have completely forgotten, completely forgotten that there is no moment that appears that isn't bringing something to act upon what we fear is a weakness so that in acting upon it, it can be revealed to us as the seed of a next strength. But the strength isn't I. The strength is in the understanding of the relationship between you as a creation and the creator that gave you your life and that put you as a tree in the forest, that put you as the flower, whatever description you want. So here it comes. Here it comes. How about this for one of my weaknesses? I feel inadequate. Do you ever feel inadequate? Do you think that the feeling of inadequacy is going to go away because you imagine the strength that's going to remove it from you? What do you think the pursuit of all the things are that you pursue? What do you think ambition is? What do you think ambition is? It is the way in which the mind says, when I gain this, I won't be inadequate anymore. 
So it calls the pursuit of strength, the, the, the love of strength, but it, what it is is the avoidance of seeing that as I am, I'll never be free of this sense of inadequacy because I don't understand it. Because the sense of inadequacy belongs to an imagined mind, a mind that's imagined what adequate is. I'm adequate when I own this, when I can go there, when I can do this. Nothing's going to matter to me. When I'm cool, I'll be adequate. No. You must be and do what is adequate to the moment you are asked to be and to do that. Because in acting in the moment of feeling some inadequacy, you are aware of something that is yet completed in yourself that waits for something to come along and reveal it so that in the revelation of this particular, see, this is the problem. Do you, I, I should have started the talk like this. How many of you like the word weakness? You go, oh, great word, I love weakness. Do you? Or, or is it something that you want to spit out of your mouth, particularly the way the world is today? Don't tread on me. So you, you can, if you can see it, how, how the, the, the deck is stacked. The very notion of weakness terrifies me. And yet everything in my spiritual development, if I ever want to know what real strength is, requires allowing something to act upon me the, con the content of this consciousness, this essence, uh, to act on that essence so that by acting on it, it can reveal what is hidden within it. And in revealing what is, again, this is the problem with language, revealing what is a weakness, for me to discover it isn't a weakness at all if I allow it to be completed by that which reveals it. Then it becomes a strength. Not my strength. Do you understand that? Not my strength. What a, what, a, what a glorious, beautiful, blessed day it is when an under person finally understands, yes, there's strength. It's not mine. Not mine. And I would never look for strength. Instead, what I would look for in the moment of suddenly feeling inadequate or in all the other things that I just went through, what I would look for is instead of trying to find a way to avoid or escape that pain, I would look for a way to understand it. So here's the summary of that second key lesson. Let's bring up key lesson number five, please. What is true never stops reminding us of what remains within us that is yet to be reconciled. But we are deceived into believing that whatever darkness is revealed by the light is greater than the light that has revealed it. Are we not deceived? Here comes this light and suddenly I see this weakness in myself. Something in me says, oh no, and it judges that weakness and it calls the weakness darkness and it calls the moment that revealed it something terrible. And what you have to start understanding is in that moment that we are deceived into believing that somehow or other this moment of darkness is greater than the light that revealed it. Can any darkness be greater than the light re that revealed it if the darkness is the absence of light? Do you understand the question? I'm trying to get you to see something. No, the light that reveals the weakness is far greater than the weakness it reveals. In fact, it's revealing that which it doesn't judge. It's revealing that which it wants me to become conscious of so that in my awareness of it, a new integration can take place between myself and real strength that I have not yet known. And then for a moment, I have a new strength. And what is the nature of my new strength? What is the nature of my new fearlessness? God willing that this should be one day all the time with you. What is the real nature of my new strength and my fearlessness? I'm not alone and I never have been. The strength of that light has always been with me. Every split moment of my life, I just was looking in all the dark corners for that which could save me from the darkness I feared. You put all of this together and here's the grand summary. Bring up key lesson number six, please. We cannot avoid any weakness we may have 
let alone resist the condition that gives rise to its dreaded appearance without strengthening the very weakness we fear. All of which means the following. The only real weakness we have is our failure to enter into whatever may be the struggle that proves our fears false. We cannot avoid any... See, do, do you understand that most of what we do in unwanted moments is the attempt to avoid the weakness that fears them? Do you understand that? Can you, avo- can you avoid a weakness? Can you? No. But you try, don't you? What tries to avoid seeing a weakness? Weakness. We cannot avoid any weakness we may have, let alone resist the condition that gives rise to its dreaded appearance without strengthening the very weakness we fear. All of which means the following, read it with me now. The only real weakness we have is our failure to enter into whatever may be the struggle to prove our fears false. We never try to prove our fears false. We try to prove that we are stronger than what we fear, and that's what weakness is. So the last thing is this. If, real, if the real failure is to enter into the struggle to prove my fear is false, do you understand that? If that's the real failure and weakness leads me to that, then what, is, what, is, what am I going to do? What am I supposed to do? I have to, if you want, I have to put my heels into the ground, I have to buckle up, and I have to prove to myself that the thing that I fear is not the moment itself, but what my mind, this dark imagining has made of it, so that if I stay there long enough, that weakness that I fear will be made into a new strength, and the new strength is that I see that's not my weakness. That's the new strength. The awareness that that weakness isn't mine, and not only is it not mine, but it's not to be feared in whatever form it may take in this consciousness. It is part of the content of my existence, and it is attempt, intended to be perfected if I will enter into the relationship with that light, that strength that is always there to show it. Let's take a break, come back and have our dialogue.
Welcome back, everybody. We're getting, we'll get started here in just a second for our Q&A with Guy. Just a reminder that all these free online talks are sponsored by the nonprofit Life of Learning Foundation. It's a 501c3 here in Southern Oregon where Guy is the director. And you can make a donation anytime to help us continue these classes at guyfinley.org slash donate. And you can do that in any, any size is always appreciated. So thank you for your help. And I also want to rem remind uh, everyone again, in case you weren't here, especially at the beginning, that next Wednesday uh, is another Deep Dive Wednesdays. Guy is going to do this once a month. And it's our chance to ask Guy uh, for a little more thorough explanation of material in a talk or in a book or possibly an idea from a past master that you're interested in. And if you'd like Guy to dive deeper into one of these subjects, write your question in to either support at guyfinley.com or uh, write it in at the foundation. But in any of these, or you can write it in the question box here, but try to get it to him by Monday or Tuesday of next week. So he has a chance to look at it and see how many people have responded in that way. So this is your chance to um, ask Guy to go a little bit deeper in something you're interested in. All right, I think that's all we need there. And let's bring Guy back in and we will uh, get started with. Guy, do you have anything more to say? I'll spend all the time that I can in the place that I'm given to stand to help you through the various passages that you have yet to understand require that you prove passable through your actions until I can't stand there anymore. I'm under laws too. I do everything that I can to make the teachings accessible. In this instance, I wrote out for you five or six special key lessons, writings. I know that when I'm going through them, you can't extract from them the meat that is in them. 
but you can catch the flavor. And if you catch the flavor, then you should be able to taste the freedom inherent in those insights. And if you taste the freedom, then you are a fool for not pursuing it with every fiber of your being because you won't find it again. You won't hear it again. And then whether or not the moment is profitable will be entirely up to what you do as a human being. Fearing your weakness, I don't understand. That's too confusing. Do you really think that because you can't understand or something's too confusing means that it isn't within your reach? Or can you see there's something in you not yet developed enough to catch all that is implied or intended and that even though you can't get it yet, you can feel that it calls for you. And if it calls for you, by God, you don't know what a blessed human being you are. Don't let your sloth your wish to be relaxed and calm and cool and all the things that you imagine make you something special. Don't let that be in your way. You find a way when you don't want to, to struggle. But you must struggle for the right thing and in the right place. Now you struggle for a strength that's imagined in a place called this world with its promises. You must struggle inwardly, and to struggle inwardly you must meet every part of you that resists whatever that moment may be because it tells you, you can't, there's nothing here, what's the point? And if you enter into that and you struggle to meet that weakness that would have you believe that's all that's available, then you'll find out that hidden in that weakness is the strength that revealed it to you. And then, oh boy, watch out, watch out. Over to you, Doug. All right, let's get started here. We have Jill in the queue, but, but let me just uh, remind, if you're new here, if you would like um, go to webinar to talk with Guy, just raise your hand by clicking the little hand icon that looks like that, and that'll bring you up into the queue. Uh, and if you have a written question, now's the time to uh, send them over to Kate, and we'll get them to Guy. So let's go ahead and get started right now with Jill. Hi. Hi, Guy. Hi, Jill. Um, I uh, quickly I had um, uh, something I used to read Stephen King novels, and um, when I was sixteen, and I would look under the bed before I went to sleep at night because they scared me. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, uh, I I was aware of um, a memory that I had that had pain in it today. And um, I watched the memory for a while and I heard it say, but you still feel the pain. What's the point? And um, two words came to me in that moment, conscious suffering. Mm -hmm. And um, it just kind of, I don't know. Um, I, you know, it's funny now that I think about it. I don't even remember what the memory was. Yeah, look, this. let me tell you why this is good. And I don't know whether I'll get to this during the talk in the pines, but now is as good a time as any to allude to it. Useless suffering is, I'm going to suffer for your sake. Conscious suffering is, I'm going to suffer for my sake. I'm not going to suffer for the sake of a sorrow, for the past, for what I did or didn't do, for my weakness. I'm not going to suffer over that anymore. Instead, I'm going to suffer the revelation of that consciousness. Then you're doing something that is so useful it can't be told, even though you won't know in the moment what the usefulness of it is. But you will know some measure of freedom because some measure of separation has been granted to you through your understanding. I'm not going to, you, you talk all you want about why I should suffer or how useless it is. Do you talk all you want? My eye isn't on you. 
My eye is on the part of myself that, is, that wants to, I, A, give myself over to you, and that B, that knows that I can't. Then I have something real, Jill. You're in the right place. You're learning the right things. Let it form. It'll take its own time, its own place, but it will, and you'll see it. Okay. Uh, we have no one else in the queue and no written questions. If anyone in the room would like to come up, now would be a good time. I guess that'll be it. Good night. <laughs>